without further ado, let's get going. Our, I'll do it later, no worries. We have plenty of time, we have the whole day. So without further ado, let me introduce Brad. Brad Fitzpatrick is from San Francisco and has been coding since forever. He works in Go for the last six years, of which he spent almost eight years. All his eight years, last eight years in Go, uh, in Google. Ah! And he works, of course, on the Go core team. All right? This is his first time in India. And uh, do you know why we were starting 10 minutes late? Because Brad almost never made it. He says, I was looking for an adrenaline rush, and I'm trying to go all over the world to see what was it that'll give me the rush. He found it here in the bikes, the auto rickshaws, whizzing past the cows, just by inches. And his, uh, I like it when he says, man, this order in kiosk really works. Over to you, Brad. How about now? Perfect. Uh, so I have a lot of slides and um, not much time, so we'll see how this goes. Um, so the timing of this is very fortunate because um, Go 1.6 came out a couple days ago. Um, who went to a party? I guess there was a party here, but I only saw about five or six people. So shame on you for missing the beer and missing the launch party. But um, it was fun. And so the timing of this conference is good because now I don't have to think of a topic. I just have to talk about Go 1.6, which is easy. Um, so the talk is titled Introducing Go 1.6, Asymptotically Approaching Boring. So I'm going to say why this is a good thing and why you shouldn't really be afraid that Go is becoming boring. So first, a little history of uh, Go's release cycle. Um, Go 1.6 came out a couple days ago. Six months prior to that, we had Go 1.5 in August of last year. Um, eight months before that, we had Go 1.4. This is breaking our normal six-month release cycle because Go 1.5 was big and we wanted to shift our release cycle away from uh, popular holidays. Uh, six months or Six months before that, we had Go 1.3. Six months before that, we had Go 1.2. Six months before that, we had Go 1.1. And because we hadn't figured out our six-month release cycle yet, a year before that, we had Go 1. Um, so back to Go 1.6. This is where we are today. Go 1.6 just came out. In six more months, we'll have Go 1.7. And then six more months, we'll have Go 1.8. Here next year, you can find somebody else on stage to talk about the new features in Go 1.8. Then six months after that, we'll have Go 1.9. And then 2.0, we'll have 2.0 in two more years here. And we'll have generics and some types, and list comprehensions, and mutability. We'll rationalize byte versus string, new versus make, colon equals versus var. The VFS will, the OS interface, the OS package will have a VFS. We'll have memory ownership so we don't have to any data races, statically provable, and years of mistakes. Everything revisited. We'll close all of our go-to bugs on the GitHub issue tracker. Yeah, who's excited? A lot of excitement. Sorry. I lied. <laughs> we'll have Go 1.9 in August, probably. And then we'll have Go 1.10, and Go 1.11, <laughs> et cetera. So when is this Go 2.0 that you're all so excited about? Probably never. Um, we basically just use the Go 2 label on the issue tracker to say, we can't do this. Sorry. We'll think about it later. I know this might make you a sad gopher. Might make you a angry grofer, but I, I'm here to console you. <laughs> so let's talk about some previous excitement um, when the language was not boring. Uh, in Go 1, we had a whole bunch of features, and it's not really important that you can read these. The point is that there's a lot of them. Um, Go 1 was not the first release. We had maybe seven or eight, ten, depending on how you count, of uh, Go releases before Go 1. They were not stable releases, though. They just um, Sometimes things would change every week, and your program would break entirely every week, and you would have to update everything. Uh, Go on added, you know, whatever. It doesn't even matter. A um, bunch of stuff. Go 1.1 came out a year later. Um, Go 1.1 had method values, which was kind of a, it lets you like curry the receiver. Like when you're using a sync dot once, it's common to do some lazy initialization that you want to be kind of Go routine safe, and so. You sometimes you make a little method on T, and you use a once, generally embedded in your struct, and then inside of some method, you say do T dot method, where method is of type, you know, empty func that doesn't return anything. So that was a nice little language uh, addition. Also, prior to Go 1.1, at the end of your function, you pretty much, if you had return statements above it, you always had to say like panic unreachable because 
there, you know, there was no way to tell the compiler that my function has to end here. So go 1.1 introduced the terminating statement rule. Not that interesting, but it was polishing the language. Go 1.2 added three index slices, so you could set the capacity of a slice. Um, go 1.3, nothing new. Go 1.4, uh, you could say for range and don't have to say underscore equals if you don't care about the values that you're iterating over. Doesn't happen often, but it was just a, a cleanup. Um, there was also some clarifications about when you, uh, about what would happen if the compiler would auto dereference a nil pointer to pointer and what became the method set. Again, this didn't affect any real code in practice, it was just fixing a bug that involved fixing the language specification. Go 1.5, um, made it possible to do a little bit more uh, type elision here. You could say map of point where point is like some struct type and then you could just use it as a literal, as a map key. Um, cleaning it up, it's just inconsistent, um, so we made it consistent. Go 1.6, has no language changes. So, any questions? I have 40 more minutes. Um, if you actually graph the uh, language features over time, this isn't very scientific. Um, you can see one over here, one, uh, there should be a one, 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 two, one, three, one, four. And it's approximately 10-ish, 20-ish features. And then the last, go 1.3, go 1.6 to 0. So if you actually look at the trend line, it's actually approaching pretty freaking boring. And this doesn't bode well for next year's conference. Um, but note that this is only language changes over time, and Go is much more than just the language specification. Um, all the excitement actually was before Go 1. Go 1.1, 1 .1, uh, Go 1.0 is all that little graph down there, and here's my scientific chart of the fun that we had before. And this fun was like, you know, updating your code every week because nothing compiles anymore. It's really fun. But I'm supposed to actually console you. I told you I would. Um, so yeah, this may be boring if you're a language nerd and you like um, designing languages. A lot of people show up on the Go mailing list and they say, hey, I learned your language last weekend. I don't really understand it yet. Um, I'm still getting my feet wet, but I have some suggestions on what you should change. You should make it more like you know, PHP or Ruby because that's the only language I know. So what do you guys think? Will you accept my proposal? And you have to say, no, why don't you go finish the tour? You're only on page seven and you know, once, once you're done, and y you try not to be dismissive, but there's a lot of people that want to change the language, but the language was pretty much done about six years ago. Um, but boring is exciting if you're trying to like ship something and run services. It's nice to know that you can update Go and not break your thing, and your program only gets faster and more stable over time, uses less memory, uses less CPU. Um, so it's nice to have a stable foundation to build exciting stuff on top. So what is Go when I say you know, Go 1.6? It's really a bunch of things. It's the language specification, which I've shown you is getting more and more boring over time. Uh, there's the standard library, um, you know, all the packages, NetHTTP, the math package, all that stuff you get when you install Go. Uh, it's also the runtime, which is embedded into every Go program you have, and it's the, like the scheduler for Go routines, for channel sends, for select, for maps, um, the garbage collector, all that stuff is in the runtime. Then there's all the tools, like you know, the compiler, GoVet, GoFumpt, uh, GoDoc, uh, go uh, imports, like all, all the little Go Oracle now renamed to the Go Guru. Um, all these things um, are part of like the tools and we keep building more of them over time, refactoring tools, like there's Go Rename. Um, and then there's the ecosystem of stuff outside, um, like stuff that we had no idea was even coming and it just surprised us one day. So the language, basically frozen. It was basically frozen six years ago. Don't get excited about it. It is what it is. If you don't like that Go doesn't have some feature, just think of Go as like a better hybrid between C and your favorite scripting language and just accept it for what it is. Um, it's really a get shit done language and it's very good at that. Uh, the standard library is increasingly frozen. We'll accept things if it like fixes a bug or makes something faster or it's obviously needed, but we don't really want more packages in there and a lot of the packages that are already in the standard library, we kind of regret adding them, but we made that mistake in Go 1 and now we can't remove them. Um, the runtime is the exciting part though. We're adding a whole bunch of stuff to the runtime all the time, making it faster and more stable. The garbage collector, uh, maps, channel scheduler. Um, so we'll talk about more of that later. Uh, the tools, all these sorts of things. Um, who, well, first of all, how many people use Go regularly here? Here, okay. And how many people use GoFumpt? How many people don't use GoFumpt but write Go? Yeah, no one wants to raise your hand. Um, 
There's also uh, go imports, which I wrote once because I was frustrated about having to make the imports at the top of the file match, you know, because the compiler will complain if you're missing one or you have an unnecessary one. So go imports is a replacement for go fumpt that automatically formats your code as necessary, but it will also add and remove any missing imports for you. So there's a lot of fun stuff like that. Uh, the Oracle, um, now renamed to Guru, will answer all your questions about like where things are defined, and you can integrate it with your editor to like jump to definition. Um, anyway, there's always new tools. Uh, the ecosystem is blowing up. There's lots of different compilers. There's now multiple compilers to go from Go to JavaScript, so you can write web apps in Go. It's somewhat immature, but it's uh, getting better all the time. Uh, there's just tons of packages. I was writing a little thing to decode a video from a, uh, a security camera recently, and I found, of course, somebody had already written it on, I just went to godoc.org and I searched for what I needed and someone wrote it. So that used to not be the case. When I used to write in Go, nothing existed. And it was kind of exciting, but kind of frustrating. And now everything is basically written. Uh, so the point is the excitement is not at the base. The excitement is basically elsewhere in the Go ecosystem now. Um, so besides the language, if we look back in Go 1, the excitement that was unrelated to the language, the big one was the compatibility promise. We said when Go 1 came out, your programs written right now in, what was it, March of 2012, your programs from March 2012 will still work. We can add stuff to the language or the standard library, but we will not change anything. We will not delete anything. We will not break your programs. And we got a ton of adoption starting with Go 1 because people you know, were sick of changing their code every week. Um, so that was huge. Uh, go 1 was also the beginning of the tooling, so you can run go git, go install, go build, go test. Um, it was really annoying before Go 1 because you had to write make files and do things by hand and it felt like you were using C. Uh, go 1.1 made things better on 64-bit systems, so you can address lots of memory, uh, added the race detector for finding bugs in your program between multiple threads accessing you know, memory that they shouldn't at the same time. Uh, also added the build constraints, more platforms that ran on more OS operating systems and more architectures. It was just a lot faster. We improved the compiler and the standard library a lot. Um, go 1.2, again, got faster. We added the go test-cover command, so you could do test coverage built in. Go 1.2 also had an improvement in the runtime that Go routines could be preempted, so if you had one that was like spinning in a loop really fast, it wouldn't starve out other Go routines. Uh, go 1.3, Again, more platforms, more operating systems and architectures. It had started to have contiguous stacks. Um, so instead of, in previous Go releases, unlike C, C and Java and stuff will have a giant stack and will use a lot of memories. This is part of why threads are heavy. But in Go, you have Go routines, which is like a really, really lightweight thread that has a stack that's small and it grows as necessary. And the way it used to work is little Go routine, little stacks, when you ran out of stack space, you would make another stack somewhere else and you would be jumping between these stacks as you called functions and returned which was great most of the time until it wasn't, until you were in a tight loop in some like JPEG decoder or something and you were bouncing between stacks and you had really big performance penalties that were surprising and then you would move some code somewhere else and your performance characteristics would change a lot. So Go 1.3 changed it to have still stacks that grew and shrink automatically, but instead of having little discontinuous segments all over, they were all, they were all next to each other in memory. And so that was a big performance win, but it also meant we had to keep track of the type of memory at every stop spot on the, slack, on the stack, which is really good also for precise garbage collection. Uh, there's different types of garbage collectors. The most uh, basic ones don't know the type of memory. So if it sees a, a, a number 1,000 or something in, your m in memory, it doesn't know if that's an integer 1,000 or if it means that's the address of some memory. It doesn't know if it's a pointer or not. So in Go 1.3, we started to know the difference between um, what types were in all parts of memory. Uh, it also was the start of a new linker, more performance, better GC latency. Go 1.4, more platforms again. Um, this one, we started to get rid of all the C in Go in the runtime in the compiler and switch it to Go. We didn't finish at all, but a lot of the C disappeared. Now we had a fully precise garbage collector, and so we always had contiguous stacks. We never had these little segments all over. Um, because of that, we now could shrink down the size of stacks from eight kilobytes to two kilobytes. So the size of a Go routine only takes like 2K of memory now. Um, Go 1.5, all the C is gone now. We deleted everything or auto-translated it all to Go. Um, it has an entirely new garbage collector. This was six months ago that it uh, shipped. And so it has a concurrent garbage collector now, so you don't have stop the world pauses that could be seconds or whatever. Uh, if you had like a giant heap before, a giant amount of memory, it could sometimes take three or four seconds. And in that case, people have given up on you and had failures. So now the goal is that there's never worse than 10 millisecond pauses. 
Uh, so all the garbage collection happens while your program is still running. Uh, Go15 also had internal packages, so you can make a package that was private to just your application without exposing it to the world. It also had the start of vendoring and a new Go doc subcommand that's separate from the Go doc web server. So Go 1.6, yes, it may not have no language changes, which is either exciting or boring, depending on your point of view, but it has um, support for more platforms again. Um, the current list looks something like Windows, Mac, Android, iOS, native client, which is like this sandbox kind of environment people use for security purposes. We also support some BSDs, FreeBSD that people know, Dragonfly, Linux, NetBSD, OpenBSD, Plan 9, and Solera. So raise your hand if you're using an operating system that isn't one of these. So you're covered. Um, we also support a bunch of processor architectures, 32-bit and 64-bit x86, ARM, so it'll run on pretty much all your phones, 64-bit ARM, 64-bit powered PC, and uh, the j we just added 64-bit MIPS in uh, Go 1.6. So a lot of these platforms are getting more popular. They're not very pervasive yet, but when those that hardware is available, Go will run there. Garbage collector in 1.6 is pretty much the same design as the garbage collector in 1.5, except for a bunch of bugs are fixed and things are tuned, and it's just it's faster. Um, this is an old graph from Go 1.5 that Rick and Austin made. This is a graph of the latency. The, the blue one is Go 1.3, uh, the red one is Go 1.5, and you can see as the heap, as the size of your uh, program's memory usage goes up to like 25 gig or whatever, you could sometimes get pauses up to eight seconds. And you can see Go 1.5 on the other hand, where the promise is it's never more than 10 milliseconds, is pretty much just flat at the bottom. But if you ignore Go 1.3 and Go 1.4 and you zoom in to just 1.5, here's Go 1.5 versus Go 1.6. Notice that this one, the x-axis goes up to 25 gig of uh, heap. Here it goes up to 250 gigabytes of heap. And the pauses for Go 1.5, where they kept going up linearly and going up pretty quickly, Go 1.6 has no problem keeping up and still only having 10 millisecond pauses all the way up to 250 gig of heap. So yeah, so the garbage collector is a lot better. And they found at the last second, they found some more bugs in 1.6 that they're already fixing in 1.7, which um, I'll talk about more in a bit. So the garbage collector was uh, refined, and in Go 1.6, the CGO memory sharing rules are finally defined. Uh, it used to be, it was possible from call from Go to C and C to Go, but we never really clarified what the expectations were from like, are you allowed to give memory that you allocate in Go and use it to C, and how long is it valid for? Um, so people were always kind of nervous. People using CGO were nervous. People working on the garbage collector were nervous because no rules were defined, and everyone was afraid that they were either going to get broken or break somebody else in the future. Um, Go 1.6, this is my baby, uh, has automatic HTTP2 support. Um, so HTTP2 basically is a new version of HTTP that HTTP hadn't really changed for 15 or 16 years. And people got sick of it. It was really slow, especially on mobile. So Go HTTP2 changes from a text protocol to a binary protocol, instead of using lots of different TCP connections, it uses one TCP connection to the server for all your requests and it multiplexes them all. So you could have one connection open and be getting HTML and CSS and JavaScript and all your images or just the start of your images to calculate the dimensions and then get the rest of the image later after you get the JavaScript and CSS. And browsers intelligently use that one connection and things are just going which way. You can cancel downloads without killing the whole TCP connection. Um, I don't really have much in the way of uh, Wi-Fi here, but I have a video that may or may not work. Um, this is a video I recorded a while back that shows the difference of, in HTTP 1.1, you see like these tiles of this image load in, because the browser will have six connections to a server open at a time, and if you have lots of latency, it takes a long time. But if you switch to HTTP 2 here, it still has the same latency, but it requests everything at once, and they all just come in. So it's the difference between, I mean, if you're on a really high latency connection, just like a phone, for instance, it's night and day difference. But um, back, to, back to big. Anyway, so HTTP2 is on by default. <laughs> Error has been detected and reported to Google. Anyway, um, so if you want to use HTTP2 in Go and you're using HTTP.get or client.post or you made your own transport or whatever, no changes, it just works. 
If you're running a server and use HTTP listen observe TLS, automatically you now you're using HTTP2 or HTTP1 still. It's uh, auto detected what the client wants to do and you speak the right protocol. No changes to your code. You still write your HTTP handlers. You still use HTTP response writer. Um, this only works for TLS for, for encrypted connections, but Let's Encrypt just came out. So certificates are now free. So use Let's Encrypt to get automatic certs and it would auto rotate them for you so you never have to deal with paying money for a stupid cert anymore. Numbers are now free. Um, the template package, who uses the text template or HTML template package? I don't use it too often, but everyone complains that it generates lots of white space. So the go1.6 temp package now has less generated, auto-generated white space. So you just put little things around your, uh, your rules or your actions, and you put little minus signs on the side where you don't want there to be white space, and it gets rid of all the white space in the generated template. Some people are very excited about this. I don't really mind the white space. Uh, it also has a new block feature, so you can define your own sub-templates and execute your templates from another template, which is kind of cool. It's also faster. There's a bunch of uh, assembly and other compiler optimizations and assembly optimizations to make the crypto and compression and sorting faster. There's also more escape analysis, so more memory is never put on the heap, and it stays on the stack and puts less pressure on the garbage collector. We've always, well, we haven't always had escape analysis, but there's been escape analysis in Go pretty much every release getting better and better, and there's more changes in 1.7 to make it even better yet. There's also a new feature in Go 1.6 that detects if you're trying to have two Go routines that are concurrently reading and writing or writing and writing to the same map. It's always safe to use a map for multiple Go routines as long as they're all reading. Once any of your Go routines is trying to write to a map, that's um, not valid. And we used to only explode when you ran the race detector. Now we explode all the time. We, they found a really way, a cheap way to make that always on. If you're on Windows, um, we will not drain your laptop battery as quickly. Um, Windows has a global timer resolution thing. They have an API call that says, like, I want blah, blah, blah resolution. By default, it's like 15 milliseconds or something. But in previous Go releases, we had to change the system. That we had to change the knob globally on the system when your program ran to make it like one millisecond to make Go work properly. And that is now gone. So we don't interfere with your system anymore, and your battery will last longer. Uh, the standard library has about 50 things mentioned in the release notes that are um, just minor little things people have. We still do modify the standard library. It's just um, not as giant and active as it used to be. So now what? Uh, we'll do we'll go 1.6.1. This is the whoops, uh, Brad screwed up release, and we'll fix some bugs. Um, notably, HTTP2, which I previously lied and told you is on by default, is on by default in a lot of cases, except for the HTTP default transport, which you use with HTTP GET. Um, I had to fix another bug at the last second, and one of my tests was wrong. And uh, yeah, so HTTP2 is not on by default for clients if you use the default transport, but that will be fixed shortly. Uh, then we have Go 1.7. The tree actually opened. I told you we do six month development cycles, so we have three months of crazy hacking, and then three months of stable. And we do that on purpose to force people to focus on fixing bugs, because everyone likes to write new code more than they like to fix bugs. So that works, and it makes a stable release, but it also makes a lot of people bored during the, the stable period, because they want to write new code. So when we opened the floodgates after a release, which was this morning, uh, hundreds of things started coming immediately, and a bunch of stuff has already merged. Um, so the headline feature in Go 1.7 will be uh, SSA, which stands for a Static Single Assignment. It's kind of the canonical way that compilers, um, it's like a, it's an intermediate representation basically, or a, a general form of keeping a back end of a compiler. So you, you parse the text and you kind of form it into an AST, and then you get it into this SSA form, and you do all the SSA, sh uh, all the optimizations for in your compiler in SSA form, and you keep reducing it, reducing it until you can't anymore, and then you generate out like x86 or ARM or whatever. So we never had this. It's um it's kind of like a, a textbook thing that everyone has done for like the last 15 or 20 years, except for Go, because Go was originally built on a compiler that predates the literature, I guess. Um, so we're finally getting caught up with the times, and we'll have a uh, kind of a optimizing back end of the compiler that. We, we had optimizations before, but they were really hard to add because of the form it was in. Now, um, there's these rule files. You can't really see it, but it says, uh, come to compile, SSA, gen there's an AMD64 file for AMD64 
64 specific optimizations and then a generic one. So we're not focusing on ARM or 32-bit um, yet, but uh, it's not really important that you can read this, but there's this really lightweight new form for people to write optimization rules that just says, like, take this thing on the left, and if it matches this kind of pattern, transform it to the thing on the right. And then some other program takes this and translates it into an efficient Go program. And then once we're in SSA form, basically it just loops over a whole bunch of passes and rules and until things kind of like stop, um, stop getting reduced, basically. And then it goes over to the AMD64 one, which actually generate, uses the same rules from the SSA form to generate actual instructions to emit. Um, so this has enabled people to do optimizations really quickly. Like just this morning, another one came in that's like, you know, command compile, more shift rewrites. Don't encode an and as a left shift, right shift pair if the value can't be encoded as an intermediate, blah, blah, blah. Some, you know, AMD 64 optimization. It says this removes, you know, 2,900 bytes of code from, you know, bingo. So look, executables are already 2K smaller. Woohoo! Um, Go 1.7, Go vendor experiment is now already deleted. It was deleted this morning. So, or Go 1.5 vendor experiment. In Go 1.5, this was opt-in, and you had to say equals one to get it. In Go 1.6, we made it always on by default, but you can opt out if you want. In Go 1.7, you have no choice. Vendoring is always on. Go 1.7 also makes the .a files uh, totally different. They're now smaller and faster. Um, if you actually look at one of the .a files in your uh, PKG directory, it's actually text, or it's mostly text. It starts with the little um, archive, the old AR format header package, and then it has this part that looks like text and it looks like Go syntax, but it's not actually Go syntax. Um, it's kind of a weird historical wart, and this is hard to parse and it's hard to extend, and it's also gigantic, being text. So the plan is to change these into zip files instead of R files, because zip files have a little table of content at the end and you can efficiently seek and get the parts you want. So this ends up making uh, your package directory four times smaller, and I guess the Go downloads, when you download a new release of Go, will also be um, a lot smaller. Uh, we're also replacing that text at the top um, with binary. So this part will change to like a zip header and a zip footer, and this textual part that describes like what a package exports to other packages. So when, you are, when you're writing a new program and you say import math, the compiler doesn't actually go look at the source code to math to determine like whether it can compile it. It actually just looks at the export data of that package and says, does it define this symbol and what is the type of that thing that it returns if you called math.square root or whatever. So this is changing to binary and it fixes a lot of bugs and makes it easier to hack on and makes it faster. Uh, there's also, because it's now gonna be a zip file here, we have to make sure our zip compression and the compress inflate are up to speed. So there's a bunch of optimizations that are pending that are about to be submitted to um, make uh, zip inflate uh, a lot faster. We also have uh, smaller binaries. These keep slowly getting bigger and it uh, kind of sucks. So there's already in progress. There was a change this morning that made uh, Godoc 170K smaller. And this guy, uh, Matthew Dembski, has a bunch more coming. Uh, we need to do something about faster builds. Go 1.0 to 1.4 were all really fast. And then in Go 1.5, when we got rid of all the C, a lot of the C code was auto-translated to Go with a program. There was a, Russ Cox wrote a Go program to read the C and convert it to Go. And it generated some really crappy Go code. And the Go code was not very efficient. So we've been manually kind of fixing it all up to make it into efficient and idiomatic Go code. Um, which is making progress, but it's not as fast as it should be. So we're finally attacking that. We should have done it in Go 1.6, but nobody had time. Uh, in Go 1.7, uh, uh, Rick and Austin have a new plan for making garbage collection even uh, crazier. In 1.6, they basically just tuned the 1.5 design. In 1.7, they're gonna try some new things. So both making the old algorithm like faster and making it more cache line aware and uh, generating better code. But they're also trying an experiment where Every Go routine basically has its own young gen of memory. So any memory that's allocated on that Go routine and doesn't escape the lifetime of that Go routine uh, may not actually have to be scanned later. So they don't know if it'll work or not, but they have a theory that it will. Uh, Go 1.7, I may add some sort of new API. The thing I was proud of in Go 1.6 is HTTP2 has no new API. It just works. You don't have to change your client or server. But HTTP2 has a new feature called push promise that lets a server preemptively answer a question you didn't ask. So imagine like you're building a website and someone goes to you know www.yoursite.com and downloads the HTML. 
but you're on a mobile phone, so you have 400 milliseconds of latency or something. The server knows you're probably going to want the JavaScript and the CSS and like maybe that image up in the corner, but you didn't ask for it yet. And so typically, the server just sits there doing nothing, and the airwaves you know, downloading it to your phone are doing nothing too, because it's still taking 300 milliseconds to get to your phone, and then your phone asks for it and makes another HTTP request. HTTP2 defines a way for a server to answer a question you didn't ask and say, oh, here's the front page of the website you asked for, and if you need it, here's some, here's some HTML and CSS. Um, so we don't support a way to answer that in Go yet and send these pushes, but we should probably add something. Uh, we also need to add or define how IDNA works. IDNA is the way that you encode um, non-ASCII characters into the domain name. I don't know what that says, but maybe in Canada it's hello, at least, or Google translates lying and something really offensive. But this may or may not work, but in the Go docs, in uh, HTTP get, in the net URL, that uh, host field, and the net dial, we, we don't really define whose responsibility it is to do all the canonicalizations to like, to ASCII form and back to and from ASCII form to Unicode form. So we need to figure that out. Uh, more architectures. People want to add Spark 64 and um, running on like IBM mainframes on S390. So there'll be a Go on Z port if you happen to have a mainframe around. Um, there'll also be optimizations for PowerPC coming from, uh, from IBM. Uh, more optimizations for ARM 64, for 64 bit like ARM bones and stuff. Uh, more little standard library things as always. Um, did I mention SSA? This is really the, the hotness of SSA. We're like, the binary should get a lot smaller, the code should get faster, and on x86, it often doesn't matter because x86 processors, especially the server class processors, are really hard, are really good at hiding bad generated code for you, and so you'll see like a whole page of x86 code that's terrible, and the processor also sees that it's terrible, but the processor just fixes it for you. Um, we've gotten lucky so far, but on ARM and other processor architectures, that's not the case, so we really need to start generating good code. So I think we may not get ARM in 1.7. We may only do 64-bit um, x86, but um, it'll be exciting. Then go on to date next year. We don't really know. We don't plan that far in advance. Um, I'm sure it'll have more SSA for more architectures. If we don't do ARM in 1.7, we'll do it in 1.8. And we'll do, you know, MIP64 and Spark64 and all the other ones. And I'm sure the garbage collector guys will continue to have fun making it faster. And then no clue, no clue. All we know is it won't be Go2. Um, but the exciting thing is Go1.x, 1.n, whatever, is a very solid foundation to build upon at this part. We keep making the compiler better, faster, generate better code, and um, make the garbage collector better, use less memory. And so the excitement can be found above the foundation. Just consider the foundation nice and boring. Um, and that is actually the end of my talk. But if anyone has questions about Go, I didn't really mention that Go is awesome. So if you're not a Go programmer, <laughs> it's, it's like totally just changed my life. I used to, I got sick of programming for a while. And um, I, I don't know, I just got frustrated that I was always fighting with the computer. And then I, I found Go and I have been like hacking nonstop for like the last six years because everything is like easy and productive. So, right. Thanks a lot, Brad. Questions? <laughs> All right, we have some questions. Oh, we even have mics for you. Yeah. Thanks for this wonderful mm -hmm. talk. And I yeah. have a question on garbage. Yeah. So you say you follow the documentation, and the 1.76. Yes. Okay, yeah, so the, the question is, like, if we're already at 10 milliseconds, what's the goal of optimizing it further? So th the goal is always, so when I say 10 milliseconds, that's a, like an absolute worst case. Generally, it's way less than a millisecond. If you have a small heat, oh, even today, even, even in Go 1. Uh, if, you have, if you're not using, like, tens of gigabytes of memory, it's going to be, like, generally under a, s under a millisecond and sometimes less. So what they've been doing when optimizing it is, reducing like the 99.9% uh, tail latency of like making sure that they always do hit that 10 milliseconds even in they're like the worst cases. The other thing that they're doing is making it use less CPU to achieve that. So right now it's, I think the original design for Go 1.5 says they're basically allowed to use one quarter of the CPUs on your machine to do garbage collection. 
which is fine because a lot of people have tons of CPUs nowadays, but it's not ideal. Like you'd ideally like it to be using nothing and still to be magically free. So they're trying to just like reduce that requirement to use less CPU to do the same job. But yeah, like don't worry about 10 milliseconds. It's going to be way less than that in, in general. Uh, well, real time means very different things depending on how you define real time. I mean, if, if you're doing uh, health-related stuff where people's lives are on the line, um, I mean, you need hard real-time, don't use... But if, if you just want, or if you're doing audio processing or something, um, Andrew Durand on the Go team has an audio synthesizer written in Go, and he does all the effects, and he connects all these pipelines together, and it doesn't, it doesn't blip out and make little noises when, when the garbage collector runs, it's fine. I mean, but, but don't use it for safety life safety critical tasks. It's, it's not hard real time. Like even, even if it gets down to one millisecond, your operating system probably isn't hard real time. So oh, thank you. yeah, but it's getting good. Any other questions? All right, we have one more. I see one. Two more. Hey, uh, this is more of a cu uh, curious question. Uh, you said you were fighting with your computer for a long time uh, before go uh, you started using Go. So what, what were you writing that time? Uh, so I wrote the question about like other languages I wrote before Go. Uh, I wrote, so back in the day when I did like LiveJournal and stuff, that was all in Perl. And for the things that were uh, performance critical, th that was in C. So sometimes it was C embedded in Perl. Sometimes it was C by itself, Perl by itself. Like memcached D was uh, all written in C. And then, you know, I saw other scripting languages come. Like Python came and it was like, okay, better in some ways, but not interesting enough to like replace Perl. Likewise, Ruby came and it was okay, but it wasn't great. JavaScript came and I was like, well, whatever. Like I'll do it in the browsers. But it's like, it, uh, it wasn't enough to go to Node.js. Like I, I had already experienced callback hell writing big servers in Perl. Like I, I wrote HTTP load balancer in Perl. I wrote an XMPP server that ran all of LiveJournal's chat traffic in Perl. And so I, I'd already written crazy event-based callback hell things in Perl. And so I saw Node.js and I was like, no, no thanks. Um, and then let's see, at Google, they write everything in like Java, C++, and Python. So I was like, whatever. I mean, I'd, I've written things in Java and it's, it is what it is. It's, it's painful and boring and verbose, but it gets the job done if you can deal with like slow startup latencies and stuff. And um, so I was never excited about it. I wrote it. I worked on Android for a while and um, I had to write Java. And you know, I, d I didn't enjoy my life as much if I were writing not Java. And then um, C++ is cool, but it's so gigantic of a language that nobody knows all of C++ and everyone speaks a different dialect of C++. And then you have to agree on conventions for your team about like what subset of C++ you're gonna use. Um, so that was kind of annoying. And Python, you know, I had to write Python at Google. And, you know, it's like the same thing. It's, it's slow, it explodes at runtime, and it can only do one thing at a time. And uses a lot of CPU to do one thing at a time. So it also has the whole callback hell thing. And there's, there's things like, I don't know, there's like three different event-based systems on Python that are all fighting to be the one based event-based thing to do like fibers and, you know, green threads or whatever that they call them. And of course, if you get a library in Python that uses one of these event-based worlds, it doesn't work with libraries written for the other two event-based worlds. So like nothing composes well. So I wasn't excited about that. And then I, I had this project that I wanted to write, the storage system to index all my stuff. And I had to pick a language for it, so I didn't want to use C++, even though I knew I was going to have to do like low level memory indexing sort of search stuff. I wanted to use C++ for that, but I didn't want to use C++ because it's not fun. I didn't want to use Python or Perl because they're bad at writing servers. They're bad at dealing with lots of connections and serving lots of things because you need to do event-based thing. Uh, I didn't want to use Java because it's not fun even though like threading is a little bit easier. Uh, so I saw Go and it's like, Go lets you write low level code when you want to write low level code, but most of the time you just write high level code and it feels like a scripting language. You know, you have closures and uh, um, you know, built in maps and all this stuff. So 
Go, Go is this like weird hybrid between um, like C and JavaScript or something. You know, like it has high level features. But the be I mean, even that alone wouldn't be enough for me to use to switch to Go. The cool thing about Go is the Go routines, that I can write blocking code and I never have to deal with like callbacks unless I really want to use a callback. But in general, you just block. If you have an API, you just call it and you wait. And it could take hours and you don't have to worry about it like consuming a thread or wasting memory. And so you could have hundreds of thousands of these Go routines all blocking, doing whatever. And your code, when you read your code, rather than like chasing callbacks and like or indenting, 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 or like futures and promises and all this noise, your code just reads top down the page. And it doesn't matter if it takes hours to execute or you have a long running connection, like streaming data to someone over WebSockets and they actually are connected for hours. You can see, like, here's a for loop in my code. And when something comes in, I send it to them on WebSockets. And you see like three lines of code where it's like four, receive this from a channel, send to the person. And it's really liberating to write code that's readable and that you can follow. And so I love Go routines. I don't love everything about Go, but I accept it. Um, it's better than any alternative I've found. I mean, I've, I'm excited about Rust in different ways, but um, it still doesn't feel like as fun and powerful and liberating and like, you know, get shit done as Go. I feel like whenever there's something I want to write in Go, like I can whip it up in no time, and I've never felt that previously, uh, except for Perl. But Perl is no longer kind of as, as powerful as I need it to be. Interesting. Yeah, I think we have time. Okay, I think you've just uh, spooked up a lot of questions. <laughs> All right, go for it. Uh, so. I was wondering what your thoughts on using Go as a first teaching language. So I have been, uh, my wife is from, uh, she's a master's in geography and she, sh uh, she wants to learn programming. So I've been teaching her. Mm -hmm. Now I re fe really uh, feel guilty teaching her in Go because I'm not telling her all of the traditional programming concepts like classes and uh, you know, all, yeah. the, all the things like that. Yeah. So, so the what do you think about that? So yeah, the question is, what is what do you think about Go as a teaching language? Um, so Rob Pike gave a great talk once, at, I think at OSCON, called like public static main or something like that, and he talked about how a lot of scripting languages just have tons of boilerplate keywords that to teach someone hello world in Java, you're like you know importing stuff and you're like public static main void like, and the student is saying, what is all this stuff? And you say, oh, ignore it. We'll get to that later. Mm -hmm. And yep. so before you even started, your, page is f your, your screen is full of crap. So in, th in that sense, I think Go is a lot easier to teach because there's, I don't know, a lot of that is not there. There are some lower level concepts in Go. Like people struggle with, you know, like what's the difference between a pointer and a value. Um, but for the most part, I think you can ignore a lot of that early on. And if you also just explain to people memory from the beginning, it's fine. I mean, C used to be a teaching language for a long time. Um, so I don't, think it's, I don't think it's that bad. On the other, I mean, I, uh, I tol told my dad to do all those Project Euler exercises in Go because he hadn't programmed in many years. He said, I don't think I've used a programming language that had like subroutines or functions before this. He always did, you know, assembly language or basic, something with go-tos. And so he uh, started learning Go just to do something to do. He said, it's more fun than Sudoku. And that was like, <laughs> so he, he enjoyed learning it. Hi, Brad. Uh, quick, quick, quick. Hi, Brad. Uh, nice presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I come from a Java background. Um, so and I use uh, Google's uh, Jules and Guava, uh, the class library. Mm. Uh, so coming to uh, Go, uh, I find uh, that many of his concurrency support in any of the data structures kind of, uh, you know, little uh, surprising, uh, especially coming from Google. Um, so for example, when you mentioned that, you know, when uh, one thread is writing to, or one go routine is writing to a map, uh, or when multiple threads are listening, uh, reading from a map, you know, other threads should not write to it. So uh, coming from Google, uh, this is kind of like surprising to me. Why, uh, why doesn't the uh, uh, associated question is, uh, why don't we find you know data structures that we find in uh, say uh, uh, the Google uh, Wawa libraries yeah. that uh, you know uh, in Go's uh, standard library? Yeah. Okay. So to to very simplify the question, I think it's like why doesn't Go provide you know concurrent hash map built in, or why isn't Go's maps thread safe by default? 
And the argument is um, that generally when you're building some data structure that needs synchronization, you have, you have more invariants to maintain than just a hash map. You have some associated data that you need to access and lock at the same time. And so rather than pay the penalty cost of making everyone you know, do their, do pay for synchronization when they don't need it, you just have people use it, you know, do their own synchronization when they want. So you can embed like a map inside something else and put an associated lock. And so we have conventions about like where you put, you know, mutexes or how you comment your code to like define ownership and stuff. So it, it's not great. We have a race detector to find it, but um, we don't we don't try to like make everything safe for you. And I don't think sh Java is a shining example here either because nobody knows. Like there, there's that JSR spec, like JSR three four four or something that defines the memory model in Java. No one knows it. And every code I see written in Java has data races like crazy. And Java only promises that the JVM will not explode and crash if you have a data race. You may have the wrong answer, but at least it won't blow up. And this kind of like, it's kind of a false sense of safety because people write all this like thread unsafe code in Java and they think they're getting away with it, but they really, they just have the wrong results. And then they're like, oh, I have a bug. So they start sprinkling uh, synchronized on random methods without thinking like, they think like the code needs to have synchronized rather than the data needs to be protected. And so like, yeah, I don't think Java is a shining example of doing it right. I'm not saying Go is perfect either, but um, at least Go is much more honest with you about like there are rules and you better think about the rules. Okay, I'm sorry, but I don't think we'll have time for more questions, but we'll take them on. Brad is here. You can bug conference. me later. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's uh, not often that you find somebody who is, uh, has opinions about a lot of languages and stuff. So I was very opinionated to myself. I got married then. Oh, I it was great. And cool. he's just got engaged. So congrats, Brad. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot, Brad.